presentation today. Um, and I know I don't have a lot of time, I usually speak for two, three hours. So I'm going to try to condense it and try to leave space for some questions at the end. Um, so first I'm going to explain to you how it works and what for and, and give you illustrations of cases. So basically uh, animal communication, the way it works, I'm going to go straight into that, is that we project our spirit to the spirit of another animal, of an animal. And we're basically we're extending our consciousness out in a certain field, if you want to call it a quantum field, and we're projecting the spirit there and we're receiving in return information. And this information can come in the form of thoughts, of words, of images, of sensations, of physical, emotional sensations, and of pictures. So the language, the language of animals is not based on words. It's not words the way we're used to speaking, language and words. It's completely different. So that's why you think that you don't understand your animal because you're expecting him to answer back with words, but he just isn't going to. <laughs> so now, you, if you are able to open up, there's a certain opening that one can create, which is the, the opening of animal communication, you will be able to receive those, that information, which is their language, which comes again in the, thought of, in the form of thoughts, words, images, feelings, feelings of physical and emotional and sensations. Okay? So when we teach a workshop, the, I give a technique that is very, very um, precise, that allows you to, to learn how to project your spirit in, in that space, and how to receive information, and how to receive information very accurately. So it's not just fantasy, it's not just, oh, well, I think my cat is telling me this, or I feel my cat is telling me that. No, it's very accurate information with a lot of validation so that you know that this is really the language that you, 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 you're getting. You're not getting something else. You're not imagining, and it's not fantasy, and it's not nonsense. It's the real language of animals. So this is the original language of all human beings. We all have it, okay? Everyone, everyone here in this room has it. Now the only difference is that some people have it more developed than others, and some people have a kind of a gift more than others. But it doesn't mean that everyone can't do it. Everyone can still at least learn the communication. So you can run. It doesn't mean you have to run a marathon. But at least you can run. It takes a lot to run a marathon, but it's still fun to run. Okay? So the, my purpose is to teach you animal communication, to teach you the language, and to teach you the accuracy of animal communication so that it, it doesn't go into fantasy and, and funny things. And the reason why I insist a lot on the accuracy of animal communication, the, the down to earth and the validation part of animal communication, is first of all out of respect for, for the animals and also out of respect for you. Because if you are able to learn that, it will raise your consciousness in a way that you will never have thought possible, that you will be able to understand animals in a way that you would have never thought. Because you will perceive their thoughts and their feelings in a way that you don't think that you can perceive. Because most of the time people live with the animals around them and they kind of, they interact, they interact through love and various other aspects, but they don't really go into the, the core being of the animal. They don't really understand completely who the animal is. What he is, what his life is about, how he's feeling, what he's thinking, what he's experiencing, what his relationship is with the, the guardian, which is you, that he's, he's living with. You don't really go into that core being. So when you, when you are able to do it, and this is why the animal communication is just so wonderful, is because you're able to access the, the, the core being, the core of the, of the animal, of who he is, his essence, and then you understand him in a different way. And then you never ever see animals ever again the same way. And you never see your animal ever again the same way. It's completely shifted for you because you've learned something different. The same way as, we, as you, I'm speaking with you now, and you understand me, even though I have an accent, you still understand <laughs> me. Uh, but in that same way, you'll be able to understand them and in depth who they really are. Not just he's meowing at the door and you let him in, or he just asks for a little bit of food and you know he wants food because it's time to feed him. Not just superficial understanding, real in-depth understanding, okay? So uh, animals have thoughts and emotions because they have consciousness. And they have the same range of thoughts and emotions as we have, the same range. So the type of emotions that we experience, uh, love, affection, friendship, uh, sadness, grief, uh, resentment, jealousy, um, joy, all the same range of emotions they have, exactly the same. And they also have thoughts. 
they think about things. They're not just sitting there. And you think animals are just sitting there. No, they're, they're also thinking. They have a line of consciousness, a line of thought. And, and one can tell that very clearly. For example, when I've experienced doing animal communications with animals, when I don't feel the line of thought, many times I've asked, are they under tranquilizers? Are they being given something? And each time it's because they have been given some kind of medication that, that sl slows them, that slows the thought process, and I can't feel it clearly. So they have a thought process that is a bit like ours, that is kind of linear, and that goes in circles, that goes back in the past, goes in the future, goes everywhere. Just not as much in the future as we do, not the same. And they don't have creative consciousness, which means they don't build things, and they don't create things, except out of the need for instinct. Okay? So this is to just give you the basis of how animals really are. And I think if people, especially people who work with horses or trainers, or any pe person who works with animals, if they could really understand in depth what animals are and how they think and how they feel, the whole relationship would completely transform. And there wouldn't be all the problems that people experience with animals. A lot of people experience problems. And the reason why they experience problems is because an animal is an animal, and he is part of a certain wildness, and he's brought into our world of human beings, and we expect him to adapt to our habits, and to our way of being, and our beliefs, and our habits. And this is incredibly difficult for them, because that's not what they're supposed to do. Now, they, they choose to come and share our life. Granted, they do choose to come, or they're sent to us, or we find them, or there's no coincidence how they come into our life, but they're still expected to do things like the way we want. And it doesn't always work like that because they have their instincts and they have their animal nature. And we expect them to adapt to our language and our system. And animal communication permits us to go to their language and to understand who they are and how they feel and their animal side. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit um, why, why people call me for, for animals. Um, and some, I'll give you some example of some cases. Um, the, m most people call me because there's a behavioral problem. Something's going on. Something's not happening. They've tried training. They've tried many different things. And it's not quite working out. So that's why they call me. So when they call me, I uh, usually walk distance. They give, give me a picture. And I, I project my spirit, as I told you, to the spirit of the animal. And I just go into his field. I go over there. I extend my consciousness to him and I can share with his being, and I can share the information, and I can receive it. So, um, and in doing so, I receive the feelings and the thoughts and the, what the animal is experiencing in his life, and I also get other information that can go deeper, which can help me to get to the cause and the root of the problem and solve something. So, um, I'll give you some examples. For example, a classic thing is finding a lost animal. So a lost animal, um, when I, I, I project my spirit to the spirit of the animal, that's why I call it from spirit to spirit, and I get pictures, I get images of the animal, of how he's, where he is. So once I did a turtle in, in America, in Los Angeles, lost turtle, tiny little Egyptian turtle like this, like the palm of my hand, and I was able to feel what was the ground underneath, I was able to see the houses around him, through him, um, through the turtle, and I got a clear description of where he was at, and by conveying this to the person, she was able to find the turtle. Mm -hmm. She started looking for the description. So I've done a lot of cases of lost animals, and it, it, the, 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 it's direct communication, which means it's direct, going direct to the senses, direct information. Okay, there's not much emotional information. Most of it is just how, what's, what's under their feet, what's around them, how it, is the air, is it raining, is it cold, is it hot? What, the direct sens sensual experience, okay? Sensory experience. Um, other cases are more complex. Other cases are to find out what is going on with an animal, how he's feeling, what he's doing, how he's living. Um, so just, um, this was, what was this? Yesterday. Just, I'll give you the one I remember the mm -hmm. uh, fastest. Uh, yesterday I was called for a lady in Switzerland who has two cats. And she told me the two cats, not only are they fighting, I mean, one is attacking another one, so the one who came in the last is attacking the other one. So they're fighting, and, but they're also peeing all over the house. Yeah. And she <laughs> said there's not one area that it has not, doesn't have cat pee. Yeah. So for anyone who's experienced cat pee, has anyone experienced cat pee? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you all know what it's like. 
So she said they're peeing in the cupboards, they're peeing in mm -hmm. everywhere, everything, except the bed, because they lie on the bed. Mm -hmm. So um, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do a communication with them. So I kind of, I had a vague idea of what was going on, but I never go with the vague ideas, for the reason that if you do that, <coughs> that is not a real communication. A real communication is directly talking, talking, the same way I'm talking with you, with an animal, but not with words, with thoughts, feelings, okay? Feel, think. Mm -hmm. That's a direct communication, it's, and it's, it's back and forth, it's like a dialogue. So I'm go giving and he's receiving, giving, receiving. So the reason why I'm explaining this to you is so you understand that it's different from psychic information. Psychic information would be, I have a picture and I'm getting stuff, I'm getting information, or I'm seeing someone and I'm getting some things. I'm seeing, maybe I'm seeing the aura, maybe I'm getting information, I'm seeing things around you, I'm getting pictures and I'm going to relay them. Communication is not the same. Communication, we go in, in a very deep state, that is the theta brain wave state, actually, actually, in a very deep state, which I'll teach you how to go into. And in that deep state, you perceive, you are able to perceive and to communicate with that animal. And it's really as if you are with that animal, you're with him, okay? Same as I can see you. I can see the animal in front of me the same as I see you. I can f see, see the fur, I can smell him, I can feel him, I can touch him. I, I, it's exactly the same. To me, there's no difference. The reality of the communication, to me, is the same as this reality. Okay? That's to show to you that there is no real reality, but we won't go into it now. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have time. So going back to the cats. So there I am with the two cats, and I, I, I'm with them. I can feel them. I can just exactly feel how they are. So cat number two, which is the one who came last, is attacking cat number one. And this is simple, this is, there's many layers to a communication. So first layer, I always go to the first layer first. First layer is very simple, he's just establishing a hierarchic position in the home towards the other cat. So he's attacking the other cat just to establish his position. That's very simple. And cat number one is peeing because she's stressed, okay? She's completely stressed out because everything has changed in her life and this cat is attacking her, pouncing on her wherever she goes, so she's stressed out, so she's hiding, she's freaked out, and she's peeing, okay? That's layer number one. Mm -hmm. I go deeper, because you go deeper and deeper and deeper when you, learn, when you do the communication. Second layer is the cats are peeing because I'm, the information I'm getting is that there are animals from outside that are trying to get in, and they're trying to protect the safety of the home. It's a territorial instinct. So I asked the lady, are there any cats um, of the neighborhood or any other animals that are trying to get in. So she says, yes, there's a garden and the other cats, there's a lot of cats of the neighborhood and they actually come into the house to, to get food. And so I said, well, that's not going to work out because cat number two is a big male warrior, warrior cat who's trying to defend territory and mm -hmm. by defending territory, so he attacks cats that are coming in, but he also creates territory by doing pee pee everywhere. So it's his territory, which means you're not allowed to come into my space, okay? That's number two, layer. But then I know something else is up. I know there's more, so I go deeper, I go deeper. And the information I get is that she's in a relationship. Now, all I knew, the only piece of information I had was that she was living with someone. That's all I had, and I had the name of the man that was Emmanuel. No other information. But the information I'm getting is that the, how do you say, the companion is controlling, is very dogmatic, is very opinionated, and she feels stifled inside, inside that relationship. And the other information I'm getting is that she's thinking of leaving him, but she doesn't have the energy or the guts to leaving him. And she's stifled and she's controlled, and she doesn't dare to express anything. And she's walking on eggs mm. also. That makes a lot of things, okay? And that's all that tension that is inside of her is not expressed and that's why the cats are expressing that t tension. And the way the cat number one is feeling corresponds to the way she's feeling because the way cat number one is feeling that I don't have my space and I don't know where to go and I'm completely, uh, I'm being pounced on a little, I'm being criticized, mm -hmm. same as being criticized, is a reflection. So I'm like, okay, great. Now how am I going to tell her all this? <laughs> <laughs> So I go very carefully and I ask questions to see, I say, and I explain to her, I say, well, I could be interpreting, but this is what I have. have. Now I've done this, I've been doing this for years and I'm very sure and I'm very confident, I'm very sure of myself. 
so I, I know how to get around, thanks to <laughs> explain what's going on. So, so then she finally says, she says, well, I was afraid you were going to tell me something that I was hoping you wouldn't because I really don't want to look at this. <laughs> <laughs> but I am married to someone who's 22 years older than me, and it's exactly what you're telling me. This is the really, I'm not married, he's a companion, but he bought the house for both of us, and I don't, I don't have, I don't, can't get out of it because I'm comfortable in the house. Uh, I don't have the energy to get out of the relationship, and I, f I, I'm, I just love it when he's not there. It's exactly like the way cat number one was feeling about the space. I just don't want him to be there. So when he's not there, it's fine. But when he's there, it's it's not it's not good. And I have been thinking of leaving him, but I'm pushing it back to some point in the future. I don't know when. So I explained to her. I said, I said, okay. So I'm telling you all this. So we went into details about the relationship. So I said, I'm not telling you any. I'm not telling you anything. You know, you 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 make your own decisions. But there's obviously something wrong because if not, the cats wouldn't be peeing all over the place. The cats pee because they're expressing something that is not going right in the life of that person. Okay? So I'm not saying that all the cases are like that, and I'm not saying that when a cat pees, there's something wrong. A cat could be peeing for many reasons, and I, I chose the example of this case because it shows all the different reasons. It shows three layers. But the really important layer is the third one. Because I gave her tips to work on the first two layers to transform the situation, but I know perfectly well that it's not going to transform because of the second, the third layer is too deep. Now, interestingly enough, the, 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 the cat that I spoke to about on the last lecture, Plume, that was also peeing in the house, another example of peeing in the house. I have many examples. <laughs> and I just got an email this morning saying, uh, for you who were at the lecture the other night, that was Plume, and I was in France, saying that the cat stopped peeing after the communication, after I spoke mm. with her. Hasn't peed in, in, uh, in a month now. So uh, we sometimes, when something comes to the level of consciousness, it can transform the situation. But sometimes it's not enough. So the cat that I spoke about that evening um, in, in Pasadena, I knew that that was enough. It was an emotional problem, but I knew that by bringing it up to consciousness, it was going to be enough. But this case, I know it's not enough. I just know that she's going to have to make some transformation in her life for the cat to completely stop peeing. So that's that case. Mm -hmm. Anyone has pink cats in here? <laughs> 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 okay, so now I'm going to give you another example of another case, because the time goes fast. Um, this is the case of a, of a horse, and uh, his name is Caruso, and he lives in France. And the, 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 the person called me because he can't do the jumping. The, the horse stops. <coughs> Just, uh, he told me I can't, he didn't say, he said I can't do the obstacles. I don't know what's going on, and I, I can't, it's not happening. Could you, could you do a communication to see what's happening with him? Why is he not jumping? So, so we do the communication. And again, same thing, there's many layers, okay? So uh, the, the first things the, the horse gives me, the images he gives me, is, is fear. So he shows me how he stops abruptly and he rears up at the back mm -hmm. and he just stops in front of the obstacle and doesn't want to go further. And therefore, practically throwing off the, the rider. Um, so he shows me those type of images, he shows me where he lives. Y usually the first part is what's happening in his life, his daily life, where he lives, how he's doing, uh, companion horses, they, they show that, they show that to me. Um, so then the, the first layer of communication is, is also uh, a layer where he's had a few traumas uh, linked to his jumping experience. So one of the traumas is that um, I get a big pain in, in, the, in the knee area uh, which is called barre in French, which means that what they do is, is um, so, that the, so that the horse jumps higher, they, they set the bar at a certain height, and when the horse is about to jump, then all of a sudden they, they lower it so that he, he, bangs, mm -hmm. he bangs into the, the balls, and which causes tremendous pain. So mm -hmm. that's horrible. They do that in America too, by the way. Mm -hmm. They do that everywhere. So, so that the next time he's going to jump higher because he's f afraid of the pain. They do other horrible things and they do them in America because in America they told me, well, this was in, um, on the way to San Diego, uh, the ranch there, what was it called, um, I can't remember the name, on the way to San Diego, uh, before Encinitas, and uh, the woman told me that one of the trainers, what they were doing before she got rid of him, is they put the end of bottle of, of beers, you know the mm. thing, and they put that there on the bar so that they, 
they get hurt, they get cut. Mm. They also use electricity, all mm. kinds of horrible mm. things. So it's, it's, it's really horrible and it's really everywhere. And one of the reasons why, why I lecture so much all over the world and I put so much energy is because I'm just praying that maybe in my lifetime, I, hopefully, I'll, at least if I'm one little drop in, on the ocean, that I can just raise a little bit of consciousness, like I'll be able to die in peace and I'll be happy that I've done a little bit. I know that it's, one can't transform the whole thing. But these are practices that are done in countries that are supposed to be uh, uh, elevated. So, so, like France, or Switzerland, or America. I mean, we're not talking of a space like Spain or South America where things are a bit much worse, or Greece, very bad in Greece. So I'm hoping to just make people understand um, what, what it's like to be an animal. So basically, the, the, this horse had a few traumas, and he was, um, he was also sold a few times. So but when the horses have a lot of traumas like that, when they're, they're sold many times, they change uh, owners, uh, guardians, they change trainers. Um, after a while, there, there's a kind of, um, of closure, of they're closed. They, they, you, you can't relate to them. You, they, people can't relate, they can't do the work with them. And it's just because they've closed off emotionally, because they've, it's just too much. Because what people don't understand also is that but they're sold all the time. And unfortunately, the horse world has a lot to do with money. And so horses are constantly sold. And what they don't understand that for a horse to be sold is, a, is an enormous trauma. You know, it's as if you were a four-year-old kid and they stuck you in a, put you in a train and they didn't tell you where you were going. They took you away from your family and your brothers and sisters and they just stuck you in a train where there's no light and you can't see and they just sent you off somewhere and you have no idea where you're going to go. So it, it's tremendous anxiety. And then all of a sudden you're somewhere and then in that somewhere people are yelling at you and telling you things that you have to do and you don't understand and then they're hitting you and then they stick you in a stall all closed up and you can't get out. I mean, th these are things you need to understand that f th for animals. If you're in their skin, you can understand that. That also they can't get out. Most, a lot of horses are stuck in, in stalls all day and they only get out one hour a day if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. This is something we don't understand. Anim the, the horses are wild animals that roam free, that gallop, that are free. So it's as if we were stuck in a third of this room all day and we couldn't get out. And maybe if we're lucky, we can look out of the window and we can open the window. And we, someone comes and takes us out, puts a thing on us and leaves us out and walks us around LA for one hour and then brings us back. That's the life of a horse in most places. Other horses have better lives. They have pastures, they have paddock at least. They get a little piece of green. Know. But you have to understand that they have a flight instinct where they want to get out and they want to leave and, they, and if something scares them, they get out. And so a lot of guardians don't understand that. They just don't understand because they just don't, don't understand what a horse really is. So there I am with this, this guy uh, from France and doing the communication. And so I, get, I, I explain to him all these layers, what's going on in the life of the horse, the traumas and what he's experienced and why he doesn't want to, to, to jump, why he's scared of jumping. But then the third layer, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you layers. The third layer, and this information I don't get exactly from the horse, I get it from somewhere else. The third layer tells me that the, the main issue has to do with performing. And that this young man has a lot of issues with performing that have to do with a, fa a father of his. It turns out that a very controlling father, uh, and a father who's never happy with what he's doing. It's never good enough, okay? And therefore, he has a, a, a need to prove in performance that he's valuable, that he's worthy, that he's doing good. And that need of proving, of worthiness, extends itself even into his relationship. So I kind of mentioned the word sexual without saying sex. I said intimacy, because that sounds better. <laughs> I used to say sex, but then I decided, well, in France, is there, they're less Puritan. You, you can. Okay. <laughs> I, I say intimacy now. I found a new word. So I said, but the need for performing actually even extends itself to that degree. Okay? So, uh, so you have things that you might have to work out. And I said, if you were able to work out those things, you will see that the whole relationship will transform. Because this is a very good rider. This is someone who knows, who's done year, uh, who was a child when he started riding, who's very experienced. So he doesn't have issues of technique, or issues of not knowing how to deal with a horse, or issues even of leadership. A lot of people who, who are with horses have issues like that that we find out in animal communication. Um, these are not the same issues. 
So it's, again, it's not leadership, it's not knowing how to write, it's not technique, it's none of that stuff, not, not experience. It's uh, something deep within him. So the combination of the three layers, so as you see, it's not one thing. It's a combination of all of them. But usually, to really get a very good result, he would probably have to work on the three layers of understanding. Okay? So we would have to work on, on, on restoring the, the trust and getting rid of the traumas of the past, past okay, for the horse, on understand, because he's been traumatized and he's had these experiences with Barré, with the problem with knees, and restoring all of those things for him. But also understanding that his anxiety to perform it ref it, um, reflects on the, ho on the horse. So that's why the horse doesn't perform accurately, which in turn makes him feel, I didn't do well, and I'm not worthy, I'm not loved, all, the, all, the, all those things. You see? Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why I'm explaining this to you is to show you that um, a, a behavioral problem, a, a supposedly behavioral problem, we, con we consider a behavioral problem, can go very, very far, and it has many, many interpretations. And oftentimes, there's a reflection of how we feel is passed on to the animal because they're, they're very, very high sensitive beings. They perceive and they sense everything. So they know what's going on with us. So communication permits you, uh, maybe not at the deep layers, but at least it will help you to understand the, the life of the animal, how he is, how he's feeling, what he's doing, what he's experiencing, and, and just that is wonderful. Just to be able to understand your own animal is just the most wonderful thing that you can experience. It's just great. It's just, there's just no words for it because it, it's just there. You're there with them directly and you just direct, you, you know them because the frustration that most of you have with animals is that you feel you can't speak and that you don't understand what's going on. You just kind of manage. It's as if you're two blind people groping in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> but in communication, we give you the key to find, we give you the light that helps you to find the access to the talk, talking to each other and understanding each other. That's just, it's wonderful. And the advantage of animal communication is that also when you do that, when you learn these techniques and when you learn the communication, it definitely opens up other areas, other doors for you. Other doors. And I try to avoid the word psychic, but it definitely opens up other aspects. And so I have people who have, I have a few people from Hawaii who've written back to me when I taught there, and I'm talking of America now, I'm, I want you to talk about the people in Europe that have had experiences, and people here, and, they, and so they took the class, and then they didn't even do animal communication, but it opened up a whole other area for them that they would have never thought, and they, they do other things that have to do with psychic work. But that was the, 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 the first opening door thing for them beyond the communication. Yes? Uh, how did you learn what you're doing? Yes, okay, well I didn't learn it actually. Mm -hmm. um, because I talk about it a little bit in the, in the book. Um, I, when I was a kid I would perceive, but I didn't realize that it was something that could be called animal communication. To me it was completely normal. Mm -hmm. So I, I perceived uh, feelings and thoughts, and I would get whole sentences, and I, I got that, I used to have it with people too, but I thought it was completely normal. And it's only when I started going to, to school uh, in, in, in France. Uh, I was raised in Paris and in Spain when I went. We, I was born in America, but I was raised over there. And I went to school, I kind of realized, well, they're not quite the same, a bit different than I am. And that's when I realized it was better if I shut up. I kind of realized it was better not to talk about um, how all the things I perceived and all that, because it didn't go to quite. And it made me more strange. Already I was American and I dressed just strange and I didn't speak French. So it was hard to integrate in, in school. So on top of it, I figured at a very young age, it was better not to show that I was a bit weird. <laughs> 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 to them. <laughs> to them, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's how. And then I, I developed a career as a dancer. Mm -hmm. And then it's just only later on in, in life in, in America. And I started getting so much demand and so many people asking me. And I started being asked to teach. And it started coming up more and more. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But one can learn. Yeah. One can learn, yes. And actually, when I went, to a, I went to a class here with a woman, a very nice woman called Carol Gurney, um, who, who gave a, was teaching. And I'll never forget, because she, taught, she gave me her book, and she dedicated her book, and she said, well, you already have it. Mm. And she was a very, very nice woman. And she, yeah, 
it was it was nice to, to mm. because to me it was normal. See, I don't I didn't realize it was just obvious mm -hmm. that that's how was one supposed to be, and to, uh, and for me to be able to project your mind somewhere else was also obvious because I used to I used to do that. If I wasn't with my parents, I would go see what they were doing, and <laughs> and then when I had my children and we had no cell phone, I would just project my mind. Mm -hmm. See well, if they were okay, because now they have a cell phone. So <laughs> 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 when they were young, there was no cell phone. Yeah. Even I lived, in, yeah. I used to live in Temple City. So when they were something late or something, I would just project my spirit and check them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not quite communication. That's just projecting your your spirit yes. somewhere, yeah. ext extending your consciousness somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, yes. So that was that was mm -hmm. fun. So I'm going to talk about euthanasia, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you would like? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a difficult subject. Um, but first, uh, first, the main thing to know is that, the, I mean, you probably all know this, at least intellectually, but there is no death. There is no death. And consciousness goes on. And I can't really relay this to you only with words, but I know it in the depth of myself because I've experienced it. I've, I've had near-death experiences, which just doesn't mean... A near-death experience doesn't necessarily mean because you do come back to the physical body, so it's a clinical death. But I've had a lot of experience with the other world. Um, maybe And maybe it's just a tiny little bit of what one can experience. It probably is. And all I can tell you is that I've experienced tremendous love and tremendous bliss, and that consciousness goes on. And I know I can only give this with, to you in words, and, and words don't do it. But... It's better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've done a lot of communications with, with past animals. And they've given me messages and they've told me things that I had no way of knowing, which proves to me that, that consciousness goes on. Mm -hmm. Because why, how would I know those things about their life or about their guardian? Um, so communication, at the, this is, uh, I don't allow the students to do this because it's too risky. At a, it's at a, you have to be at a high level when you're dealing with issues of life and death because it's a very, very big responsibility. Um, but it helps, it helps to know if an animal is ready or is not ready um, and what's, what's going on for him. Um, and obviously without ever imposing one's beliefs or one's interpretation because it has to do with the, the decision, sole decision of the animal, but unfortunately, uh, being an animal, your sole decision depends also on the guardian because really the guardian is the one that makes the decision for you along with the veterinarian. And that's why where animal communication is, is incredibly useful because it permits you to know where, what the animal really desires. Because sometimes an animal can be very, very sick and it doesn't mean he wants to go right away. It's, it's not because he's hurting that he wants to go right away. Um, and you had a question or you just... Oh no, I'm sorry, scratching. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so once I did um, communication with a dog um, in America and uh, I did the communication when the, the, uh, the dog was already passed. And I knew the dog because the dog had cancer and we had been you know, doing the healing for, for, for the dog. And the dog had survived much more than what he was supposed to, to, to survive of, thanks, to the, thanks to the healing. And so when I, le I left to France and the dog was actually doing very well, even though he had cancer. And I was still w working on him regularly. And he was actually doing really well. And. Um, so I went off to France, and when I came back, the woman called me, and she said, I would like you to do a communication with my dog, because he's passed. We, 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 we euthanized him. So I was very surprised. I said, well, I don't, why did you euthanize him? Uh, because he was actually doing well. And she said, well, uh, do the communication first, and then we'll talk about it. She didn't want to talk about it. So I did the communication. And the first thing he told me is that he wasn't ready to go. He was actually doing fine with the cancer. And he wanted to stay, and it was very important for him to stay for the person. Mm -hmm. And that the decision was made uh, against his will. Um, and he, so he talked about that, and then he talked about um, the life with, with the, the woman that was his guardian. And he said that it was very important. He really wanted me to convey the information that she had to trust herself, that she had to trust her intuition and trust her instinct, and that it was OK. Um, that there was no judgment, and that he didn't want her to feel guilty. Um, but he really did want to stay, but not to feel guilty that there was, there, he wasn't judging. It was okay, and it was okay now, but he really wanted me to convey that to her. So, so when I got back with her uh, on the phone, and I told her that, and she, she was crying, 
and she said that what happened is that they, they put the shots and the first shot, which is to put him asleep, and he didn't, he didn't go, and he was struggling. Mm -hmm. And they put the second shot and he didn't go, and he continued struggling. Mm -hmm. And she said that they put him the dose of a horse <sighs> for him oh to go. And, that's, and so that's why she felt so guilty. And, and she said that she didn't want him to go. She, didn't, she wasn't ready, she didn't want him to go. But the husband and the vet decided that it was time because he, got, he started limping. But he was actually okay with the cancer, but he started limping and the husband and the vet said, well, that's it, now he's limping, it's really time for him to go. And it's, some vets, I'm not speaking at all again. I mean, some, I know amazing vets, I know extraordinary vets, I, I have a great vet. <laughs> he's filled with compassion and so this happened to be the one case of that, of that vet. Um, and so she made the decision against her will and she went there and the dog was not ready to go because he hadn't finished what he had to do with her and he knew that she wasn't ready and he knew that she didn't want. Mm. So that was the that was so that was the communication that I, we did after. Now if I had had the chance to do the communication beforehand, maybe she would have listened and maybe she would have waited. See. And when he gave her the information about following her guts and her intuition, that was linked to what happened to her with her husband, which she hadn't, hadn't done. And that was the main thing he wanted to convey to her. And I didn't know this, because she didn't tell me. She told me after. So, um, yeah, with, with euthanasia, it's, uh, it, can, it can really help you, because a, a lot of mistakes are made because, we, because someone tells you or the vet tells you, um, that's it, you have to euthanize, he's suffering. Um, and, and sometimes it's not the time. For example, uh, I, I did a dog in Switzerland, and the dog had per, per pulmonary edema. I'm, I'm talking about that case because that, that's a good one. I mean, we've saved many, many animals with, with healing and that were supposed to be euthanized. Many animals, just with communication by saying they're not ready, and with healing when the whole medical team said it's too late. Um, Actually, I spoke about the, 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 the dog, didn't I, in Pasadena? Mm -hmm. So I'll speak about another one. This is a, a case of a husky who had, um, he had an accident and he had a fractured uh, atlas and a crushed larynx, mm -hmm. okay? So he was in a lot of pain. And these are these were people who are breeders, husky breeders, and they, they use them to do, um, what's it called? You know, when they, ca they pull the- uh, Dog sled? That's mm -hmm. it. So, um, so they, they came, they called me, and they said, um, well, the vet wants to euthanize right away because we can't do anything. We can't do anything about, about it. Um, wh wh what do you think? So I did the communication, and the, the husky was very young. I met her after, beautiful husky. <laughs> I met her. Um, she, she wanted to continue living. She said, I would like to stay if I, if I can, if it's possible to stay, if it's possible to, be, to recover. Obviously, she, she didn't necessarily want to stay if she was in so much pain. So I told the guardian, I said, look, she really would like to stay if we can recover, so I'll give it a try. Now, this was completely against all the medical possibilities because the doctors, you know, the, we, we even asked other vets and they said, no, this is not doable because the crushed larynx on top of it, she can't even breathe. And so I, I often get cases like that. I get like the last op possible cases when no, the vet sent to me when they can't do anything about it. So I said, well, if the, if the animal still wants to live, then it's worth a try. So did the healing, I walked distance, but then they brought her to me. They brought her to me, they lived in Switzerland, so they brought her to me in the, in the north of France, which is at the frontier of Switzerland, and I did a few ha ha times hands-on. And all I can say is, is, uh, is that a few months later, she, the, the dog is recovered, uh, the head is straight again, it's, she's completely recovered, she can breathe, she can eat, and the last I heard, which was, um, so this was a year ago. The last I heard, which was uh, I think three or four months ago, they sent me a picture of her on the with, with the other dog, the other dogs. So that, what I'm trying to say is that euthanasia is not. You see, sometimes the medical condition says nothing can be done, but my belief, and maybe it's just a belief, and nothing I'm telling you is the complete truth. Okay, nothing I'm saying is the truth. It's just a belief on my mind based on my experience. But my belief is. If a soul, if a spirit of an animal wants to stay, it's worth trying saving them. And sometimes we can't. I did. I, I had. It was in the case with a horse right now who had a, um, fract a multiple fractures due, due to osteomyelitis. Three months old fowl, foal. 
female soul foal, and the two vets said it would be non-ethical and non, uh, what was the word they used, it was very really strong, non-ethical and non, uh, I can't remember the other word, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, do, to do anything else, it, ha it has to be euthanized right away. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I was, I had a feeling that I wasn't going to be able to, to do that case, even though I've done difficult, very difficult cases. And so I got another opinion from spirit world, um, spirit doctors, and the, the other opinion was also, um, this is going to be very difficult, so the foal is probably going to be euthanized. Mm -hmm. Nothing one can do much about that one. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. But animal communication helps you to get in touch with the spirit and that tells you, I want to stay even if my leg is hurting, I want to stay even though if I have cancer. Because people assume that just because an animal is suffering, he has to go. And that's not necessarily true. He might want to continue living. Human beings want to continue living. It's not because they're old that they want to die. And it's not because their arm or their leg hurts that they want to be euthanized. It's the same with animals. So, take questions. If you have questions about the workshop, I didn't go into much details about the workshop. Does your book teach you how to? No, the, the, the book gives, gives a lot of, um, it does give a lot of guidance. You read it? I don't, it I, I don't realize anymore, but it gives a lot of guidance, gives a lot of examples. Um, but it doesn't actually teach the technique um, for the good reason that, um, for me, the teaching of the animal communication is a big responsibility. Uh, and I want to make sure that people do it right. And they do it in depth, and they do it right, and they do it with integrity, and there's the validations. And you can't get that from a book. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't give techniques, but I, I do give a lot of guidance in there. I think I answered correctly. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to add that, um, you know, in reading the book, um, how I came to Lila myself is, I read the book in two days, cried for three, mm. and then looked her up on the internet because I have a dog. But what it showed me is how, um, how we put our emotions mm. on the animal, um, and they take it. Yeah. They take it. And um, just... You know, maybe looking at what I'm experiencing can be a great help to them. And, um, I mean, the stories in the book are just so phenomenal. And then, actually, when you get to meet Lila, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an experience that you'll never forget. Um, my dog is a new dog, and she's 13. And uh, just... Um, learning about how willing they are. I mean, obviously they come to you for a reason and how willing they are to just, you know, take whatever you give to them, but, you know, we don't give them justice. We don't know how to honor them. And reading that book really, um, just from the examples that you use, really teaches you about honoring them. Because we just think that the dogs or the, your animals are there for your, you know, Pleasure. <laughs> it's very, very big. What an animal is, is just very big. The soul and the spirit and the love and not all animals are love, you know, some are aggressive and all that stuff. But what, what most animals bring to people in their lives is just unbelievable. And what they put up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and the, the, it's true that the book is, is um, in that direction, showing what how what animals, what they absorb about us, of us. And it's, about, it's about the healing of the person and the animal. They're very big spirits, much more than what we gather, much more than what we can see. Yes. So when you do a communication, do you go into a meditative state? Yes, yeah, so I think it's, the terms are difficult to define. Okay. Terms are difficult to define. Um, and I usually tell people, I say, it's not about emptying your mind, which people think that is what they have to do in meditation, which I personally don't really think, because it doesn't work. It's not emptying one's mind. <laughs> If you've ever tried, you probably have tried, it just never works. Um, I would call it more about focus, but it, it would be a meditative, in the sense that meditative state is a deep state, mm -hmm. it would be that. But I would definitely say it's more focusing your mind on one direction. 
and so that you, you put aside the, everything around you, like when, you tr when you're crossing the Red Sea, and Moses crosses the Red Sea, mm -hmm. so he's pushing, oh, I don't know, I wasn't there, but yeah. he's pushing the sea on each side, and they're walking through, so that would be a bit that, that idea, okay. focus. What's interesting in all your stories, all the, the problems that are going on with the animal run parallel with what the problems are with the human. Many yeah. times. Yeah. Not always. Not, uh, Not always. You can get animals who come from a lot of trauma, from ba different backgrounds, and they are just like that. Uh, um, or they can be, like my neighbor's dog, <laughs> very hyper. It has nothing to do with, with uh, my neighbor. She's not hyper at all. Mm -hmm. It just had, came into that life, but uh, it came like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, an animal comes with certain aspects, and it's a teaching lesson also for the person, even if they're opposite aspects, or they're not reflecting, or they're not parallel. I, I mean, my belief is that you attract a certain animal, there's always a reason. But we don't, one doesn't have to go into that each time. Yes? You have questions? I love that you saw my psychic hand, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had heard um, somebody else speak on animal communication, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on it as far as the animal taking on like specific diseases for the human and that kind of a thing. Yes, oh, thank you. I like that theme because I specialize with the healing, and it's very close to my heart, mm -hmm. that theme. Um, okay, I would never ever say, I would never affirm, because I think we're not allowed to affirm things. People just yeah. say things. Yeah. <laughs> they don't even know if it's true or not. And I would never affirm that an animal is taking on the disease for us, because how do we know? Right. We, we don't know. Maybe it, maybe there is a soul mission, maybe there isn't, and we don't know any, any of that stuff. Now, what I did notice, it is true that a lot of animals parallel illnesses. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I remember when I used to live in Temple City, the, the man who lived across, his cat had back problems, and he was going to have a very bad surgery, back surgery. Mm -hmm. And I met a horse who had... Um, how do you uh, call it? A tumor on um, on the le right side of uh, his cheek, mm -hmm. and she had exactly the same thing on her, the woman on her left. Uh, mm -hmm. I met tons of cases of, of uh, similar, uh, uh, or animals get sick right after the person gets sick. Mm -hmm. So I I have encountered a lot of those cases, but I would never use the word that they take on. Mm -hmm. Now, what, an another thing I have noticed uh, is that they also can get sick. Um, for the person, like I've seen, mm -hmm. when like uh, uh, animals with cancer, and things that the person hasn't dealt with, and deep resent, usually linked to a deep resentment mm -hmm. or deep anger, mm -hmm. and maybe at the same, like for example, there was a horse. He's in the he's in the book. So she had an issue with her husband who took away her son. Blah blah blah. She got very, very breast cancer, and she got healed from the breast cancer, but the resentment was still there and the anger, and then the horse had a tumor. Mm -hmm. But I'm still no one to say that that's why. I'm just noticing, mm -hmm. because the problem is, if I say that that's why, that implies tremendous guilt for the people, mm -hmm. which I don't think is going to help them in their lives at all, mm -hmm. or help the animal, and it implies that animals just take on, and they don't have a life of their own, and they don't have their free choice and their free destiny, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want to say that, because I, I don't agree with that. I think they have their free choice, mm -hmm. and their, their own choice of spirit and their own destiny, but maybe certain animals come in for that. A lot of animals come in the life of a person to help, mm -hmm. to bring things to help, and maybe some to take on. Mm. I, would, I would be more moderate okay. in my way of saying things. I know some people are maybe less moderate. Mm -hmm. but I, what I've learned, in my, the little bit I've learned in my life is you can never affirm anything as a truth. Mm -hmm. There is no truth. And it, uh, most things are based on people's experiences and their reality, and that just doesn't mean it's truth, mm -hmm. or their reality. Do the animals know you're, you're, you're like sync, in sync with them like today? Of course. Oh, Probably. they completely know. Oh, they completely know. Um, I mean, some people take the class and they go back home and there's a complete transformation. Or animals do something that shows them. It's, it, sometimes it even happens while in class and the person at home tells them, oh, you know what happened while you were in class? <laughs> they, <laughs> no, they, they, they completely know. They, they, they are in tune with you. We're, we're the ones who are in, in tune with them. Right. They, they are they're in tune with our mind. They, they're in that di dimension of thinking, feeling. They pick up on everything. Yeah. I mean, this is what I spoke about in Pasadena, but I'll say it again. Uh, a horse, for example, a, a dog, well, you know, everyone knows, like, 
Have you all experienced that when you want to wash your your dog? You just you're not even no, holding no, the shampoo no. bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I just thinking about it. Hiding under the pillow. Have you experienced that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Have you experienced that when you're going to go on a trip? They already know you haven't even taken the suitcase out. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. They pick up on your thoughts. So yeah. it's the same thing. So a horse knows exactly when it's going to be sold. Mm. He knows. Oh. The dog knows when you're going on a trip. You haven't even put your clothes together. You haven't even talked about it with words. But you've thought about it and they know. Are you a vegetarian? That's a very complex question. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take right now. I was a complete vegetarian for years. And now I'm, uh, I don't eat meat. But um, because of all the traveling in Europe, I have some, some fish some chicken mm. yeah because it was too difficult and I was I was getting sick yeah. because I couldn't keep a vegetarian diet in in, uh, in Europe uh. it was very difficult with the traveling uh. mm -hmm. so um, now now and a, a belief of mine um, which is a belief it's not no truth is um, the way it was for example in the past for example in Native American culture um, the hunting was sacred mm -hmm. and they, they, there was prayers done over the animal and the animal gave himself up and it was it was a sacred event, and that animal nourished everyone, and nourished nourished, and f and they used him for the clothes, and they made the ox and, and right. bo bows with the ligaments and the tendons, and when obviously when it was like that, I think it's okay because the information I received from up there, spirit doctors, uh -huh. is that they said you have teeth that were made to eat meat. They were made like that, the teeth, um, but the problem is the way it's done nowadays is completely wrong. Mm. Right. There's tremendous cruelty, and it's just all, everything is off. Yeah. That's why it's completely wrong. But I do eat cheese. I mean, the problem is if you would have to go the whole way and not even eat cheese, not have any dairy products, because the dairy also is... Right. I saw the cows in France. Ah. I saw the type of life they have, and those are the good lives. Because they believe that to make good cheese, they have to be... They have to be have a nice life. So they're free in the, in the mm -hmm. pastures, but then I saw when they're tied up there on the thing. Yeah. I saw a lot of things. Uh, I saw a lot of horrible things. Yeah. Um, so yes. Yeah, so the, the, the food, it's a very it's a very complex. I usually don't go into that subject because it, everyone has their own beliefs, especially food. You know, food and, reli and religion and death or things that people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very important to them. And um, we I, I talk to people about natural food and good food for for their animals in the workshops. Mm -hmm. I give them a lot of tips that can make the animals much more healthy mm -hmm. and happy. But the theme about being a vegetarian is very, very personal to each one of you. I'm a huge animal rights activist. I'm yes. a little bit farther than what most people are. Like, I don't tell anybody this because I've gotten really bad um, reaction from it, but I don't think animals should be used for medical research either. No, I'm completely against that too. I agree well, with that's you. nice to hear. Yeah. Well, of most course, people are like, I agree. I'd rather a rat die than you die, and I'm like, mm. no, I completely agree with you. I mean, you should see how rats are. Rats are nice. They're adorable. They you are. should see the spirit they have. They mm. have an amazing spirit. That's why when you can just understand what every animal is, when you understand the spirit of a mouse and you can communicate with a mouse, it's obvious that there can't be experiments done on a mouse. Yeah. But you see, well, everyone has his purpose. Your purpose is activist, and I, my purpose. Is hopefully is to raise some consciousness but we're all working in the same direction mm -hmm. but my, my brother is a big is a was a he's a scientist and he once he took me to a hospital and I, I saw the animals uh, and I I, 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 was, I couldn't sleep for months mm -hmm. I was very upset that was a long time ago it was when he still uh, before he came to America yeah so I'm against all those things too there's a lot of cruelty yeah there is a lot of cruelty and there's a lot lot to be done and it's going to take a long time Probably. Yeah. Because there's also other countries where there's less consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you separate yourself from that? Because like anytime I see anything happening, like I have a violent reaction and I can't even watch <laughs> stuff. Yes. So how do you still do what you do and see yes. what you see and not have a meltdown every five yes. minutes? Now that's funny, they ask the same thing in Pasadena, and in every single workshop I teach, people ask me the same thing. For the reason that the people who come to learn this, they are usually people who are sensitive, very sensitive, and they usually have already some kind of empathic, telepathic ability. Because I didn't speak about telepathy and empathy, because mm -hmm. I, I didn't have time in an hour. Um, but you, you end up just having to. You just, you can feel, but you understand that it's their life and not your life, and to be, in order to be able to mm -hmm. help them, you can't break down, because if you break down, you can't help anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're still allowed to cry. 
it's okay to cry. I mean, we're in a human body. We, we, we're supposed to experience all the human emotions. Mm -hmm. So we're allowed to cry. Crying is part of a human emotion. We're not supposed to be saint. No one asked us to be a saint. And no one asked us to be above everything and not experience things. So if we experience our emotions through animals, that's the way it is. Sometimes it's, the, it's the crying through animals that helps people to cry for other things that they need to cry for. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so, as far as I've known, animals live in in the present. Yes. Um, now, do animals think about their history or like their past? If in the case of that, there's not something traumatic. Yes. Do they on the everyday? Do they have memories and recollections yes. of things that they used to? Yes. So That's they good, do. Good question. Uh, I get in. According to the animal, again, it's not the truth. According to animal communication, I get that they do because they can. They show me things of their past, and okay. I can feel the things of their past through them with the emotion of what they've lived in the moment. That shows to me that they do. What I think is that they spend much less time. I think it becomes more like an instinctive reaction. For example, an animal who was who was beaten. I don't think he's going to be thinking. He's going to be living in the present with his new family. He's not going to be thinking of when he was right. beaten, but if something is going to trigger it, a mm -hmm. uh, memory is going to trigger it, then the, mm, it will come back up, but with a reaction, mm -hmm. not necessarily go back into a memory mm -hmm. the way we do. Right. We spend a lot of time in our past. In our past, that's what I was trying to yes. understand. They, they don't. So they, they don't. No, they're much more in the present, they don't project in the future. Now they do, because they do project a little bit. Um, for example, you know, my dog, when she knows I'm going to leave to Europe, I mean, she's projecting into the future, she's getting anxious. Yeah, my dad but she's picking up on what I'm thinking of, what I have to take and what I have to do, and she's picking up on that. They're still much more in the present than we are. I mean, mm -hmm. we could really learn from that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do animals, um, do they reincarnate? Okay, that's another question. A very good one. <laughs> I like that one. Okay. Um, when I'm in I, Europe, do they attach to the same souls too, or is it always? <laughs> that, is this a really big? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's too big. It's <laughs> very big. I don't know. Am I allowed to continue? I'm just I'm curious if now, your okay, animal. Okay. In, in Europe, I don't answer that question. Okay. For the only reason that I want, to, I want to bring animal communication to the veterinarians and the chiropractors and the trainers, and I want them to believe that it's a real thing. So if I say the word reincarnation, they're going to say, oh, she's a kook. Mm -hmm. We're not even going to listen. Um, now, I, I have my own beliefs, which, yes, there is reincarnation. 